Welcome, welcome. Um, yep, there for I those am. of you who don't know Mike, um, he's going to help us hallucinate. Um, <laughs> Mike is a well-known uh, technical writer in the tech writer community. Uh, you're currently lead tech writer at Quadrant. Uh, where you're creating clear and engaging documentation for developers and sysadmins. I heard everybody heard that. Engaging documentation for sysadmins, right? You heard that, right? And mm -hmm. um, you're also known to have created uh, some of the most authoritative content in Linux security and identity management. And now I'm very much looking forward to which part you're going to take the story. <laughs> the stage is yours. Great. I mean, let's see. I guess we're running, running a little behind. Last time I timed this talk, it was about 16 minutes. But uh, as Garrett said, it's been a long day for many of us. Go so for it, and we have a shorter break. Okay. So it's time for a different approach. After a whole range of talks on how to implement AI, I'm going to take you all on a journey through my personal vision of artificial intelligence. Before I start my talk, I'm going to go into a bigger question. If my clicker works, I have to... Uh... There we go. Can AI be funny? Seriously, though. I learned through humor. I wanted to learn more, so I started with the perspective of Boomer. You see my gray hair. Uh, someone whose first vision of AI came from the movie 2001 and the HAL 9000 computer. My next vision came from Star Trek, the next generation and Commander Data. He tried so hard to learn to be funny. Not even Joe Piscopo could help. And with that, I'm here to help AI hallucinate. It's been a year and a half since OpenAI released ChatGPT. It's already changed the world. It's helping me write blog posts and I I'll show you how it's helping me learn and write about AI. Even with hallucinations, they're helping me. So if your medical professional is okay with it, take what you need and join me with this for this ride with helping AI hallucinate. But first, I'm Mike Chang, and I write technically. I have ambitions. I'm going to take control of AI. Think I can do it? Well, not a chance. But seriously, though, I've been looking for ways to learn about AI. And it's already changed my career. Here's the real subtitle for my talk. How I use AI to write about AI. I would like to thank Quadrant for the opportunity to learn about AI. But unfortunately, my work for them is now at an end. I now do understand AI better. I hope this talk helps you. And I'd like to keep sharing what I learned with the world. If you'd like the slides for this talk, I've shared the URL here. I'll share it again at the bottom of later slides. You can also find my info at ai-techwriter.com. Seriously, though, we've all had high hopes, dreams, and maybe even nightmares about AI. So I ended up re-watching 2001 three times. Yeah, I know the movie came out in 1968. But after ChatGPT became popular, I started having visions of HAL 9000. For all of its horrors, it's a movie full of nostalgia. It included a space station with hallucinations from the past, like Hilton Hotels in space. Well, that hasn't happened yet. But this hallucination came through. Video chats. They don't even use landlines. Ding. So I started research about a year ago. I attended a tech writing conference with, where they talked all about the theories behind AI. Some of the speakers came from universities, so they wrote papers. Here's a blurred abstract of a typical paper on AI. The words were so full of gobbledygook, the paper might as well have been blurry, or a hallucination. That's when I knew I needed help. So when I started my AI education, I figure I'd ask Jerry Seinfeld for help. With AI, you can get help from the comedian of your choice. If you're not happy with the answer, ask again. Challenge AI. AI fills in the blanks. You can even ask Jerry to be funnier or more technical. But of course, there's a risk of hallucinations. 
unless you use a tool like retrieval augmented generation, you'll need to check Jerry's work. But first, as any good prompt engineer will do, I'm going to set the stage for AI. With these parameters, I set parameters for ChatGPT to focus the search and how to interact with me. Try it. Use the comedy guru of your choice, and then you can also start prepping for the LLM. As you all know, the database for ChatGPT4 goes only to April of 2023. The databases for other LLMs also have limits. Whatever one you're using, the question remains. Can Jerry Seinfeld help write your software docs? Now it's time to start ragging on rag. I'd rag on more AI topics, but I only got 15 minutes, probably less. Whoops, there we go. Yeah, what's rag or retrieval augmented generation? It's retrieval from some reliable data source augmented by real-time data and the rest, it's complicated. So I asked Jerry about RAG. Jerry uses his friend, George Costanza, who's always paranoid about what people think of him. I think this fits as many of us have imposter syndrome with AI. Well, that's maybe not quite paranoia. Imagine him in an interview with a company that's working on RAG. He talks about how RAG has helped him cook dinner for his friends how it augments the virtual encyclopedia of, of cookbooks with tips and tricks from chefs on the Food Network. Here's a great image from Pinecone, why we need RAG. As you know, ChatGPT brings us only to April of 2023, so RAG can bring us to the present day. Without RAG, we seek hallucinations. Without RAG, we have a phenomena which I'll call M-A-A-S. And here's the kicker. It's mansplaining as a service. With that perspective, now you're ready to jump in. Read something crazy like one of those academic papers on AI. Better yet, try one of those Jupiter, Jupiter notebooks that show you how to implement RAG. With the perspective of Jerry Seinfeld, you're ready to see how RAG works beyond just typing in a bunch of commands and code. If I were creating new content for a section on RAG, or even a blog post, I'd do the following. First, as Jerry, I'd describe RAG, or I'd ask Jerry to describe it. ChatGPT first responds technically. Second, I ask ChatGPT to respond as Einfeld. If I'm not satisfied with the answer, I could ask ChatGPT to be funnier. I've shared the results at my professional site, ai-techwriter.com. It includes results in Markdown because that's what I asked ChatGPT to download things as. Next, let's co-sign some similarities. First, let's review. Here's the basic definition. When two bits of data point in the same general direction, so when you match such data, they enhance the accuracy and reliability of AI. And if your head isn't exploding already, you must be really into this. I see that, I think. Wait, I remember geometry. Cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So if the angle is small and the directions are similar, the cosine is close to one or a perfect match. But that's still a little nerdy. So next, I asked ChatGPT to explain cosine similarities to me by channeling the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I asked for a comparison between the Mona Lisa and Whistler's mother. Of course, there are some similarities both paintings. They're both well known. They're both major works of art. So Mrs. Basil, courtesy of ChatGPT, tells me, so you want to compare the Mona Lisa to Whistler's mother using cosine similarities? Well, first off, let's set the scene. The Mona Lisa, she's sitting there with that smile, right? That smile that says, I know something you don't know. And then there's Whistler's mother, all stirred and 
date lady looking like she's about to say, James, I told you to clean up your room. So we know there are a few differences. To compare the mu's and cosine similarities, we'd have to turn them into vectors. Imagine that, turning these iconic pieces of art into a bunch of numbers. But when we talk about a high dimensional vector search, we're talking about not three, but hundreds and maybe even thousands of dimensions. But with that in mind, let's compare. So we're each channeling once again the marvelous missile. So Mona Lisa's vector might be all about subtly mystery. And the Italian Renaissance, while well, Whistler's mother vector is all about American realism, sternness, and a touch of Victorian restraint. Turn those sentiments into numbers and you have cosine similarity or some other form of similarity, if you will. Technically, cosine is one of several major forms of similarity search. And once you've set up different parameters, like Mrs. Maisel suggests, you can set it up with cosine or other similarity search mechanisms. Next, we'll nosh on a neural network. I'm using nosh in a Yiddish sense, like how Pac-Man chomps on all those little bits of data. So once again, let's review. Let's define a neural network. But wait a second, these are all weird definitions. But neural networks make choices. Let's find a practical example. Here's a view of a food discovery demo. It's a infinite menu of different food choices. So you go through the menu. Let's see what happens. If you're playing on cosine similarity or one of other similarity searches, you want diners to like something. If you say, okay, I'd like sushi, the AI will start to spam you with sushi-based options. But what if you encounter a picky diner? The AI frequently don't, doesn't know what to do with that. Given the thousands of dimensions possible with food. So let's figure out some other options. So back to Jerry Seinfeld. I asked him via chat GPT about the cold start problem. In his response, even Seinfeld worries about hallucinations, how some random food database might suggest that you have a peanut butter and pickle sandwich. And you're like, are you sure? And it's like, I'm 99.97% sure. Give or take. However, if you do cosine similarity correctly, you'll find that most people hate the idea of a peanut butter and pickle sandwich. Or maybe that's just me. I've tried a food discovery battle and said no to everything. And I still get food options. Try it for yourself. Here's a URL to a model that I've used. But if all else fails and you're setting up the model, Jerry Seinfeld suggests incorporating a pizza into the model. And there's a basis. Many claim that pizza is the most popular food in the world. In other words, it has greater cosine similarity for most everyone. Here's a fourth challenge that I came up with about two this morning. That specific time I woke up uh, thinking about my talk and all of a sudden this struck me. Privacy and customer secrets. You're probably familiar with the Samsung case. If you're not, here's the headline. Developers at Samsung use ChatGPT to find a bug fix. ChatGPT consumed Samsung's proprietary code and shared it with the world. Technically, it's known in AI as data leakage. However, from the point of view of the Samsung developers, it was context stuffing. It was just telling chat, they were just telling chat GPT, this is what we want fixed. Full disclosure, I used a lot of context stuffing for this talk. So chat GPT can now use my talk as training data. I certainly hope so. However you like your stuffing in Turkey or in peppers, it has a lot of cosine similarity and it's easier to use. 
All I need is the LLM and the context. And when ChatGPT gives me the answers I don't want, I blame hallucinations. But instead, to prepare this talk, I add, I stuffed the LLM with context, it then gave me the results I needed. So what are the lessons learned? It's been a crash course for me and AI. I was pushed through the academic papers that were like, well, if you're familiar with Flesh Kincaid, professors of AI would have trouble reading those papers. But AI could consume such content, so I learned more about it using the perspective of my favorite comedians and their techniques use relatable everyday examples. This is AI the Docs. One holy grail of technical writing is to write for the use cases of your customers. Tell AI the use cases you're looking to cover. Do a little more context stuffing. If you want to avoid the gobbledygook of those AI PhD academic papers, ask AI to answer from the perspective of your favorite comedy girl. Just remember, check for hallucinations. I tried it the other day, and, it and I ended up having to change 90% of what ChatGPT gave me, but it gave me a starting point. And just as importantly, with the stories from your comedy gurus, actually AI's interpretation of them, you're able to talk to your friends about AI and what you do. And with that, it's time for a different kind of commercial for myself. And I'm thankful for the time I had at Quadrant, especially it helped, since it helped me learn about AI. But that time has come to an end. So let me sum up my credentials. I have subject matter expertise, identity management, security, DevOps, and now a bit in AI. I'm working on a professional website at ai-techwriter.com. I've built new docs from scratch do it for you. I live in the Pacific Northwest in the Portland, Oregon area, and outside of that, I work remotely. And with that, I say thanks very much. Here's the URL for my talk and my professional site. And I have time for, or I might have some time for questions, and let me see what the chat looks like. Uh, I will stop sharing. Not yet. People still have to write. Thank you, Mike. And um, I hope that you're going to very, very soon find the terrific team that you're looking for and the next challenge. Um, I have one question until they come into the Q&A. Um, have you ever tried explaining this to um, kids who really don't have the technical background but still have the incredibly flexible mind? I try explaining it to my wife all the time, who's uh, who's not technical. And one one analogy I like to use is counting cards in blackjack. Uh, I mean, if you take the, I think it's I heard the number twenty trillion tokens of data on the internet, and try to search search through all of that, it might take you a while. So you need techniques like card counting, where you actually segregate things into into buckets sort of like cosine similarity to get to make ai actually work in a reasonable manner mm -hmm. and i have one other question what is the type of use for llms that you don't often hear being talked about but you really would like to be picked up and done uh I'm not sure that uh, that applies per se because people are trying to use LLMs for everything, everything. and things they shouldn't, like uh, like proprietary information, which is another use for uh, things uh, options like retrieval, augmented generation, where you can actually feed it the proprietary data that you have, keep it secure, and use that to supplement uh, an LLM like ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.